Okay. I'm really, really excited that all of you are here today because like I said, I see friends in the chat. I see new faces, but I'm going to consider all of you friends today because of what the, uh, because of what was just said in the introduction. This is a safe space for me. I feel confident in this space that we can protect this space for each other today. Um, if for no other reason than the fact that it's Valentine's Day and we should show love and generosity on this day to the people around us that we care about. And I care about all of you very much. With this time, I hope that I can inspire you to think creatively about the mental powers that you already hold inside yourself. And this isn't just for people with uh, diagnosed ADHD or anxiety or anything else. This is for anyone who wants to learn more about your brain on your own terms. If you're a neuronormie, don't worry, you're still in the right place. So a little bit more about me. You heard that I'm the creator of Karen Test Stuff, the YouTube channel. I'm also cat mom to Liliana of the Dark Realms, whose uh, name comes from Magic the Gathering because I'm kind of a nerd. And I'm also a chooser of joy, which is something special because even in tough situations, paint it with rainbows and sparkles and say that everything's going to be okay. But I can learn from those tough situations and hopefully make my life better in the future. And I take joy in that. But I do want to cover a few things before we get started. Um, every time I give this talk, it's a little bit different. So this list is probably not all going to be covered today uh, within the stories that come out. But if any of them do come out and these topics are sensitive for you, please feel empowered to choose not to watch or listen. I won't be offended if anyone leaves mid presentation. And I ask anyone else to be gracious with anyone who needs to leave as well. Um, I challenge you to explore that discomfort later in a place that is psychologically safe for you, if that's not here today. But if we're all okay, I'm going to move forward. This quote is uh, by the artist Aurora, who is, um, if you've seen her TikToks or Instagrams, she is the quirkiest, cutest being I have ever seen on video. I internalized these lyrics that spoke to me and said that you have value just as you are. You don't have to change anything to love yourself. I embrace that which makes me me and grow closer to my true authentic self in that way. But I need you to remember something else as we proceed. It's just like he just stated, this is only my experience. I'm gonna try my best to just use the words my and I in these stories that I tell. Um, what's easy for me with time and practice and lots of support might be difficult or even debilitating for some other people. This isn't for you to compare yourself against, but just for you to start to think creatively about your own strengths. The way we address mental health with language is really important. There's a few terms I want to define for you before we move forward so you share a bit of my context with what I'm saying. My friend prompted me after this talk one time and asked me about the language that we use to describe these conditions. How what's going on in his brain, he might use this word to describe it, but that word means something completely different with my experience. And there's something very important to remember is that one person with ADHD is not the same as another person with ADHD. We all have different strengths, struggles, and we're all on a different place in our journey. So let's talk about what I mean when I frame this talk. If you want to dig deeper into any of these topics that we're going to discuss, I'll have a GitHub repo linked at the end of the presentation with resources and a good place to start. First and foremost, we need to talk about the difference between neurodiverse and neurodivergent. Neurodiverse or neurodiversity to me is a blanket overview of all of our brain patterns. Every single unique thought in this huge overview, like a light map of the world like this one, but with many more colors and shapes and unique. 
it's a beautiful, glorious mix of differences. Neurodivergent, to me, remember, is harder to define because you bring into the idea of normalcy and what a divergence or change from that normal might look like. But uh, what is normal in the first place? Is that normal for me? Is that normal for any of you? Um, normal for your friend? Who knows? Uh, I find it really hard to baseline the human experience because of our neurodiversity. Even two people on similar journeys aren't in the same place again. So I've learned that empathy for others can be a powerful tool in our software toolbox and deeply influences how I view the world on a daily basis, understanding that everyone is different. All right, let's meet my current diagnoses. These three names were presented to me uh, at different points along my journey of mental health. ADHD, anxiety, and depression became labels that helped me understand a little bit more about how my brain works and why it works the way it does sometimes. Words hold power to me, uh, give me focus to direct my attention to. I get frustrated when I'm running up against a problem that not only do I not have the answer, I don't know what the question is in the first place. Understanding more about myself and hopefully some of these questions that drive me um, is something that I've just recently started exploring, although I've likely lived with these conditions for a long time. Let's take a look at each of them individually and define a bit of my experience with them. ADHD or attention at hyperactivity disorder uh, is the most recently label, most recent label that I possess. I was diagnosed as an adult female, which is a little bit unique, uh, especially with my, my own bias. Um, I thought only kids had ADHD, particularly rowdy young boys. Uh, my particular diagnosis points to the inattentive side of ADHD, where that means it's hard for me to focus if there's more than one thing or more than one stimulus or more than one thought happening at the same time not the hyperactive side that comes to mind as my first symptom. Um, as ADHD gets studied in adults more widely, these shared conversations can come to light. The taboo kind of lessens the more we talk about this stuff. But the dark side of my experience with ADHD has been that I've often, often felt isolated within my own chaos. When there's a crisis going on around me, like when I lost my job or when my marriage broke up, it's hard to metaphorically see those people who are there and want to support me. I know on a clear day in daylight, they were like five, six feet in front of me. They're smiling at me. They're welcoming. They're warm. But in the midst of that chaos, I can't see them. I have to rely on trust. And in those moments, that's when I feel very alone. Because of all the chaos, it's hard for me to know what's a priority. When everything is the most important thing to do, I spend so much time trying to figure out what I should be doing that I instead run out of time and do nothing. It's a form of to-do list paralysis. That also contributes to the fact that I have lots and lots of ideas and don't really follow through with them so they don't get completed. For that, I've learned to reach out and get accountability buddies. So that gives you kind of an idea as far as what I face as far as symptoms of ADHD are concerned. Next is anxiety. Anxiety was a bit of a surprise to me though. Um, I thought everyone just worked like crazy until your heart gave out because that's what I had to do to survive when I was working two, three jobs to make rent. When I got promoted to a manager position at work, I thought I had made it and that it would be better until I ended up in the doctor's office with um, a shoulder injury from aggravated muscle tension, stress. I was also in the midst of a toxic and abusive romantic relationship, which was very hard to balance with my career stress at the time. But when I finally sought treatment, my doctor recognized that I was suffering far more than what they thought to be the natural level of human stress. 
The psychological terror being caused by my anxiety was exhibiting itself in real physical ways on my body, even if I refused to admit that it was real. But I started taking regular medication again around that time. On the doctor's suggestion, I finally started listening to the experts. The medication helped me manage some of the dark side that I experienced, but really only took the edge off. I still lived with situations like rejection-sensitive dysphoria for ages. Rejection-sensitive dysphoria is a funny thing where if you really, really, really want to do something, but you're afraid that someone will see you doing that thing and think that and question you for doing it or tell you that you shouldn't be doing that or that you're bad for doing that. And so instead you do nothing another form of paralysis, which you'll see is kind of a theme with me. Um, but in, an, in another attempt not to fail, I'm obsessed with my past performance. I want to uh, replay scenarios over and over to see if I could have responded in a better or clear way or prepare myself for situations like that in the future, which doesn't really serve anybody, but gives my brain a little bit of a creative outlet that will fuel some of my testing later. And last, I need to introduce you to depression. Depression has been with me the longest, over half my life now, ever since my first suicide attempt when I was 15 years old. As a young person, I didn't understand the urges that I felt to try to feel some semblance of control over what I thought was my spiraling life, when really I just wasn't being me. And I was angry about that. But I have so much empathy that I would never send that anger towards another person. And so I sent it towards, towards the only target that I had, which was myself. The dark side of depression is just what you think it is. But let me add a little more color to the darkness that comes to mind. Have you ever been so tired that you wanted to pick this up? But you can't send the signal from your brain to your hand to make it move. You're stuck. Tired of being tired doesn't really cover it. Tired of this bland, colorless plane of existence where nothing is ever good or pure or real. So why should I continue breathing? Gives a little bit more of an idea of the anguish. And when I'm so tired that I can't feel anything anymore, that's usually when the intrusive thoughts start. By intrusive thoughts, I mean the thoughts that tell me that I'll feel better if I feel anything, even if that anything is pain, which can lead to self-inflicted harm. Some of this I've learned to control. Some of this I struggle with now. But I do know that in my darkest moments, if I can break that nasty illusion that is emotional isolation, that the worst wave has passed. So that was a lot. I have to remind myself to take some deep breaths after that part because it's very heavy. So I'd like to remind you all to do the same. Depression specifically is not something just figure the magic potion. Um, if it was, I wouldn't have been in a really dark place like I was recently, but it's okay. I'm allowed to have big feelings and Friends, if you're feeling big feelings about these things that I'm talking about, that's okay. You're not alone. I know there's a bunch of you out there that probably feel the same way that I did, totally hopeless and just looking for something to make you get through the next 15 minutes. I'm with you. Not every option is going to be a winner when you're on a mental health journey. Sometimes the therapist that you worked up the courage for six weeks to contact sucks. Sometimes the meds don't work. Sometimes you don't feel like you're getting any better. But in my experience, I find that having trusted friends who can sit with you at your worst is an in pressure. And today I appreciate all of you being trusted friends in this space with me. I have a challenge for you, in fact, if you're in this dark space that I just described. Join a card league. Go play disc golf. 
find a reason to wake up tomorrow because no one's going to give that to you. You have to find it within yourself. And if you don't know what that is right now, that's okay because you're still on your healing journey. And that's part of the process. But the important thing to remember here is that growth still happens when we're broken. And it can be beautiful. So with each of these conditions that I've described, I've given you context for what I've experienced. Now let's talk about what I've used to help me work through these symptoms in daily life and then how they apply to testing. So ADHD doesn't have to be, ooh, shiny thing. Do I enjoy a good shiny thing? I really like rocks. Yes. Do I also know how to forcefully hold eye contact in very stressful situations because I've learned through therapy how to cope with masking? Also, yes. I've learned through this therapy and coaching how to embrace the pieces of the chaos that serve and excite me and start to feel empowered to say no to those that don't. Hopefully, with some time, that storm of sticky notes becomes something a little more usable. So let's redefine some of these common behaviors in ADHD to something that will be useful for us in my testing. Living in chaos taught me early on how to prioritize. Even if it's through trial and error, practice makes progress. And being able to figure out the most important thing to test first, my friends, is the most important. It's like half the battle. People sometimes equate ADHD to having a constant stream of questions going through your head. It's me, I'm people. Um, it's pretty accurate if a little bit simplified, but what it does is it feeds massive curiosity into my testing. Why does this work this way? How could this work? Why should we be doing this in the first place? And then obsessive pattern recognition is another thing that I attribute to ADHD because it gives me an acute eye for detail. I know just from being a user of technology how a login feature should work. And when something deviates from that market pattern, it feels icky and off. Um, but the eye for detail comes from being able to pick out individual pieces of what doesn't feel right and then use that in my reporting. So those are just a couple of ways that I flip ADHD to work for me. Anxiety doesn't have to stick me in a corner rocking back and forth overthinking about the problems of the world like I do. Uncovering the causes of some of my stress or the situations that trigger the anxiety helps me separate some of the chaos into something that I can understand. Once I understand the problems that lay before me, I have a better shot of finding solutions for them. I can rally my empathy and injustice complex that fuel this anxiety and they can be used for good by looking out for others when designing and testing software in an accessible way. So let's look at some ways I've been able to redefine aspects of living with anxiety. The personal trauma that I've experienced in my life has given me a unique perspective that others who have lived through that kind of trauma will re recognize. I feel a tiny shred of comfort that I've been able to connect with people like that on that level um, because I feel called to help others who have suffered like I have. In this way, my personal trauma is translated directly into intense empathy for others. My injustice complex works overtime when something isn't right. Those invented scenarios that I was talking about earlier that I like to replay in my head, they become test cases, charters, personas, all sorts of fun ideas. Gives me a basis to explore alternative paths I wouldn't normally think of and ask what could go wrong. And while I'm looking for what's the worst that could go wrong, I'm performing risk assessment. Gives me great practice for doing it at work. Anxiety can be used as a resource in our daily work as testers to work for me instead of against me. And then we come to redefining depression. I've figured out one or two things about my particular brand of chronic, chronic depression, mainly that it's always going to be under construction for me, kind of an eternal question mark that I have to check in with myself on every now and again. But while I'm checking in with myself, I do recognize that there are pieces of this that still work for me. The ups and downs of my chemical imbalances in my brain have, over time, taught me how to manage my energy and time when I feel the most empowered to make a change. 
this helps me be the most productive when I have the most resources to spare and then rest when those resources are low, hopefully not when they're all the way gone. <laughs> Learning how to ask for help was one of the hardest things I ever had to learn. The fact that I had to accept that I couldn't do this on my own was really difficult for me. But in opening up and being transparent, I've found the most amazing community of supportive friends and colleagues. And therapy has given me the language that I need to be able to describe my needs and experiences to others who want to support me, like those in my community. Being specific in my communication has taken a lot of the stress out of asking for help as well. So what do we do with these newly determined mental strengths that I have been able to make use of? As an additional disclaimer, please don't push yourself any more than you have the capacity for. This isn't meant for you to compare yourself against again. This is just to show you how I've been creative with my brain to hopefully inspire you. It's okay to rest and recover. In fact, it's essential to your health. So here's my new views. Same labels, new look, even depression. I'm still working it out, but I'm counting progress as positive gain. So let's take a look at some example scenarios that showcase the strength I flex with the tools I've gained through living with these labels. Imagine you're testing a system you've tested 100 times before. There are existing bugs that the developers are working on, but no new features to test. So let's do some exploring. Now we know the heuristic that you'll never find new bugs testing an old system the same way that you've tested it before. So that's where my ADHD shines. I get bored looking at the same things over and over. That's an opportunity for automated regression testing. Instead, I like to channel all those invented scenarios of what could go wrong, use my risk assessment of what's the worst could go wrong while assessing what's more likely to go wrong, and then start exploring that area of the system. If you have trouble coming up with what to test, try exploring the system while acting as a persona. I use my invented adversaries in my testing from those scenarios I was talking about. I imagine them as upset customers. What would they do in this scenario? I got to ask and act as a mischievous party recently, in fact. I got to put on a mask and play like a villain trying to inject malicious code for our unwitting users to execute. Buah ha ha ha. I captured a request with Fiddler, used my hacker skills to inject a malicious encoded script into the payload. Once the user opened up that message and clicked the link, they're toast. But alas, our code did what it was supposed to do and the malicious link didn't stand a chance. Thwarted again. Personas help me explore old systems in new ways and you don't have to have a new feature to play with them. Even legacy systems have new opportunities for testing when I channel ADHD and anxiety together in this way. For this next scenario, we have a new feature that includes an update to how the company's profits versus losses are shown to the user. The way the designs are laid out, the profits and losses are notated by green and red numbers. Follows what we would consider to be a normal design pattern. Well, I know someone who's unable to tell the difference between the color green and the color red just based on looking at it. It's due to a color vision deficiency. When someone I personally have a relationship with is unable to access something that we all take for granted, it ignites a fire of injustice in me. Which I know this is a very small example, but there are much larger examples that can be embarrassing or painful or, or harmful to people who can't access our software. So it's really important that we keep this in mind. Based on the presented designs, I would advise that the business find an additional way to notate the positive and negative numbers, like with a plus or minus sign, or like an appropriate heading in a column of data. In my personal context, this scenario became a partner with that intense empathy and injustice complex that I feel. I was motivated to speak up when I saw an issue that wasn't top of mind for others. This all drives me to promote the prioritization of accessibility within our software and hopefully increases the quality for everyone overall. We've all been there when we've got 14 tickets to test the night before the sprint ends. And there's no way this thing is going out, but you have to test what you can test. 
Over the time I've lived with depression, I've had to make a lot of hard decisions about where I spend my limited energy resources. When so much of my recent life has been determined by big, hairy decisions, I'm not left with many resources to take care of myself. But like I was talking about earlier, when I have the ability to focus on a goal that really gives me purpose, I can start to say no to the things that drain my energy for the wrong reasons. When I'm presented with challenges like the 14 ticket scenario, I once again call on my risk assessment from before, but add to that the dimension of spoons which if you're not familiar with the term, it's popularly used in the mental health community to refer to your ability to complete tasks or the effort that you have to spend on something. When I wake up in the morning, for example, if I have low energy, I might quantify that in the form of two spoons. Now I know to get ready for the day, I need to brush my teeth, eat breakfast and shower. But that is three things. I only have two spoons, so I have to make a choice. Now, once again, because I know myself, I know that eating breakfast will likely fuel a little bit of energy for later on. So I make the choice to eat breakfast and brush my teeth with the hopes that that energy will allow me to shower later. So now that we know what spoons are, I can look at the tickets that I have in front of me, rank them with the risk assessment, pick up the tickets that I can complete with those available spoons and the other stuff. Hopefully by now I have the language to ask for help. So through the stories that I've shared today, I reframe my experiences into something that can be constructive in the software testers toolbox. How the flurry of activity in my brain provides creative test scenarios, even in systems that have a long history. It turns out being scared of everything actually fuels a deep desire within me to help others, especially those who have shared my experience in some way. And living within the highs and lows of depression has given me the tools that I need to plan measurable goals for testing and for my future. But my outcomes that I've shared today are not guaranteed. You are responsible for taking control of your mental health. Your actions influence your life. I choose every day to make this my reality in real life, not a fictional scenario. Some days it's easier than others, but I choose to feel joy and I choose life. But it is a choice every time. You're the one who must live in your brain. You have the power to make it a comfortable place to be. What choice will you make? <laughs>